excellent speakers. Hi, um, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for Series Series to um, invite us to speak uh, this morning. Um, I would like to introduce uh, our guest uh, today, Maria Kiriakou. Um, I received that from your office. It's so formal that I need to read it but, uh, very, with attention. I will. You are president of international at ITV Studios. You oversee ITV Studio production companies across Europe and Australia, uh, and in particular the scripted businesses, as well as ITV Studio International Distribution Arm, which name is ITV Studio Global Entertainment. Um, I hope you follow me. Uh, it's one of the most important international production and distribution business, and you have offices in, in the US, Germany, France, Australia, and the Nordics, and your distribution arms is huge. <laughs> I will not say figures that are um, maybe not, not that interesting for us. You joined ITV from the Walt Disney Company, uh, where you were before uh, Senior Vice President for the Digital Media Distribution, EME. And, um, and that's it. Maria, uh, before going into what ITV uh, is doing, uh, what it has been always your dream to be the president of ITV Studio when you were a young girl. What, what were you imagining? Um, I, I didn't imagine. I did, I, honestly, I didn't think this was the industry that I would stumble into. Um, it, it happened by chance when I was in my 20s and a job came up at Disney. And I was very lucky because I hit what I think is the best industry. Because it, it's, it never stops. It never stays the same. It's always changing. And at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're bringing joy into people's hearts. That's what we do. We, 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 whether we're on the business side of it, the creation side of it, we are spreading joy and we're connecting with people everywhere. And I, and I can't think of a better industry to be in. Good. Um, I have a lot of questions to ask about Disney, of course, but it's not the, the purpose of this morning. Uh, what did you bring from, from your experience of Disney to ITV? Why you are at this position at ITV? Um, so, I mean, Disney is a big organization that, unlike, I think, any of the others in our industry, goes beyond being able to be defined as a television company. It's, a, it's an entertainment company, and it reaches people and family audiences in a way that's very unique to Disney. Um, I spent 15 years at Disney and I moved around constantly. I went into different roles and I saw it from lots of different angles. It is a fantastic 15-year education for anyone who wants to go into the media industry and see it at the cutting edge and do, trying to do things first. We were always trying to do things first. So when I was running digital distribution, we were trying to do things before everyone else. You know, and, I, and, I, and I think for that, we should be grateful for Disney because they are pioneers in a lot of ways. Um, I moved to ITV to become more in the heart of a company in the country I lived. And it gave me um, a lot of freedom to pursue where I thought the business would go. I've, I've been given a lot of autonomy and choice as to where I spend my time. And it's allowed me to do what I always wanted to do, which was to invest in content from everywhere around the world, not just one domestic, national, group of production companies, but to expand wider. Um, and for that, I'm very, very grateful. So that's, that's you know, s such a program. Let, let's go maybe uh, through a, a trailer uh, about yeah, what ITV is doing, so we will have an idea of uh, what we are speaking about. I'd forgotten how long that was. <laughs> <laughs> and also, d that, that's about our marketing team having fun. They're quite a young marketing team and they like to get creative with our promos. So yeah, that was as much their work as everybody else's. But that's really impressive. And we've seen a lot of uh, genre from the crime art, the player drama, comedies, even uh, diversity comedies. And do you have any limit? Um, I, I don't think so. Not in terms of the stories that should be told or the genres. I mean, we don't, we don't set out and say we want a quota of crime shows or anything like that. 
it's not, that is definitely anti the philosophy of what the studios is. I mean, should, should I explain a little bit more about how we, how we operate? Yes. Yeah. Um, so we are... Because um, you are not doing that by yourself. Am I going to do that? No, okay, no you are not <laughs> producing that by yourself. No, no, of course not. <laughs> um, so what is really important for, for us always to explain to everyone we meet for the first time is that ITV Studios is a, it's a collection of producers who have their own creative autonomy, have their own names, their own teams, their own offices. We are a collection of 55 production labels. Each of those operates semi-independently and semi-autonomously. And they lead with their name, their reputation, their shows. Um, we are not a command and control structure that um, gives them quotas or sends them off in a direction in terms of their development. We think it's really important for creativity to be at its best that it is the producer's choice and the writer's choice about what they're doing and who they're working with. And we don't put, we, we do our best not to put any walls around that. Um, and I think what we try and put in our, whether it's sort of marketing promos, is that we, we, we want to emphasize that and we want to bring that out. We feature the, the faces of the actors, we feature the names and the reputations of the production labels. We try and bring it all out because we are a collection of talented people, not one big company. So you are buying companies. That's your day-to-day -day business. Um, so I wouldn't say we're buying companies. I think we have, um, we've gone through a growth period. And we went through a growth period because if you took us back seven years ago, uh, we were very much the in-house producer for ITV in the UK. We were very much a British production company, a strong British production company, but a British production company. And in order to change that, and in order to seize the opportunities of what was becoming increasingly a global business and a much more interesting business outside the UK, not just in the UK, we have invested. And we have grown much more outside the UK than we have inside. We now make most of our revenue from outside the UK. Most of our production labels are outside the UK, not in the UK. And so we went on a few years of, and actually we're still continuing on that journey. It's, it's not over, we still intend to grow, of what we would call talent acquisition. Um, we, we don't set out to buy companies for the sake of buying companies. We're not a, you know, investment banking group or a venture capitalist group. The, we're a strategic buyer trying to bring the most talented people together. And depending on where you are and what stage that person is in their career, they want a different response. Sometimes, in certain territories, France being one of them, the independent production there is, you know, good producers work for themselves and they take a share of what they produce. That is right. So if we wanted to be in France, we, we thought the best route was to buy and we were lucky enough to meet the wonderful team at Tetra Media early 2017 and they came into the ITV group back then. Similarly in Italy, we met a fantastic group of people called Catalea who make a show called Gamora and Sabora. Same thing. We, we bought the company, we share the ownership of the company with them, um, and they work as part of the ITV group. But in other circumstances, we have started companies with people who've wanted to start from scratch. They've either come out of an existing company or an existing job, and they want to create something, and we've backed them. We've given them funding, both as equity and as, um, as, as, a, as a loan to allow them to start their business. And a good example of this is Apple Tree. Uh, with the wonderful Pew Burnth, who I think is quite a regular at these things. I, I'm sure you all know Pew, because she was the executive producer at DR when um, the killing was, get, was happening in the bridge and all those wonderful Scandinavian shows. And with Pew, we've set up a new company in Denmark, which Pew will grow, hopefully with our support and encouragement over the next few years. Occasionally, in certain territories, you hire. Germany is a market where actually there's not a huge amount of independent producers. It, most people work within a larger organization. So we have hired in Germany and we're building a business within our own ITV label. So it's just really important because we quite often get seen in the press and reported based on what we buy. That's not the point. The point is to build a talented network of people and we will be very open and flexible about how that happens. 
So I'm, I'm very happy to hear from you that the talent is also uh, within the producers, uh, mm -hmm. not only with the creators, because I'm, I'm, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Alexandra Lebret. I'm running a fantastic organization called the European Producers Club that gather 120 producers across 28 countries in Europe. And I'm also a producer myself. So, um, so I'm very focused on, on, on producers. I'm, I'm very happy that to, to hear that. To you, how many companies do you own in the UK? Um, so there are 55 labels, however they were created. Whether there was an employee who took off you know, and created their own identity or whether it was bought in. In the UK, we are, I'm trying to get the statistics right. Hold on, 55. 24 in the UK, 31 outside the UK. Which Majority of them are not scripted though. That is important. We are a studio that has entertainment formats and we are the, um, we make the voice in a lot of places, including here. Uh, we make a show called I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, which is the biggest show in the UK and Germany. So we make a lot of other shows other than drama. It's a lot. Mm. And, and what is uh, strange for me is to see ITV is also a TV a broadcaster, to see you producing bodyguards, for instance, bodyguard um, uh, in English, in good English. Uh, Was it in French? Did you say it in but French? No, no, I would say in Latin. Oh. But uh, <laughs> in French, is a bodyguard, is a, is a um, garde du corps. It's a, a different world, actually. Mm -hmm. um, bodyguard was commissioned by the BBC, yeah. and uh, you were financing it. For us French, it's something that uh, I don't think it can happen in, in the spirit of having, a, for instance, a, a, a show financed by Canal and, and, and produced for TF1, uh, even if some move in the market are, are doing that. That's something natural for you in, in the UK, and do you think that's something that can spread out? Uh, I know that Germany is doing as well the same, having companies working with, uh, uh, owned by broadcaster working for another. What is your vision of that? Um, this idea, to, I mean, we, we were chatting about it before, and I, I, I use the word independent to talk about the culture and the choices that people can make. Um, rather than the technicality of whether we are owned by the same group company. We are. I mean, ITV is two businesses. It's the UK commercial broadcaster, the largest commercial broadcaster in the UK, and then the studios business, which is the production business. We operate relatively independently with each other. Um, they can commission who, from whoever they like. We work together a lot because the relationships are very good. Um, and we are the biggest commercial producer, so it's natural that quite a lot of the shows would come from ITV Studios. But it is not a forced relationship. There is nothing there that says you have to, um, you have to commission this show. We have to present the best possible shows for ITV to choose from, and they will commission them if we have the best producers. Um, it so happens that we do have quite a lot of good producers. Um, that independence is also on the studio side. It's really important when we have these labels that we are not telling them, and we would, it would be a big shift from our culture and the, the story we, we tell and the promise we make them if we ever restricted who they made shows for. We encourage them to make shows for the BBC and Channel 4. I think it is healthy to have an outlet for their creativity. And the BBC gives them another way of bringing stories. So, you know, the bodyguard was was a ongoing relationship, you know, continuous relationship that the writer and the producer had with the BBC around a show called Line of Duty that had been a big success on BBC for years and the bodyguard was a, from the same team, same producing team, same writing team, it was very natural for it to be on the BBC and we were very happy when it was so successful. It was a huge success. Huge success. Biggest show for 10 years. And in what sense was it a success for you as a, the owner of the company? What did it bring to you? I think it gave us that glow of a brand that everybody recognizes. You know, no one cares about a corporation. No one cares, oh, look, here's ITV success. Everyone reacts when you say, oh, oh you know, one of our groups made the bodyguard. Everybody reacts. You know, it got 23 million views. I think it's very hard to get statistics out of Netflix, but they actually announced that one. And I think within four weeks of it going out on Netflix, they had 23 million people watching it around the world. That gives us a huge sense of pride. Ooh. So these are the, the, the broadcaster arm, but also yeah. the distribution arms. How does it work with the company you are in, that are labeled to you uh, with the distribution arm? Is there an obligation to work with them, or uh, how does it work? 
on a concrete so, basis. So we have one of the, we think it's a benefit we bring to producers coming in is that they have an in-house distribution company. Um, the distribution company brings money, yes, a deficit fund, but a lot of time what they're bringing is a connection with the rest of the world. You know, a lot of the effort that GE puts into drama is about raising co-funding money and co-production money. They, they've become much more involved in the creative process very early and having someone who is in-house, who is the default distributor, is very helpful for deciding how you're going to invest in and find the funding for these big ambitious projects. There is nothing that says every single show has to go to Global Entertainment, our distribution arm, but they have a first look. And most of the time, they have found a solution for how to fund the shows, no matter how big and how expensive and how ambitious they are. I mean, at the moment, they're, they, they, they're handling two pretty big shows from a, from a financial obligation point of view. They're, they're handling a show called Snowpiercer, which is the most expensive show we've made within our group, and it's coming out of our US division, who I also oversee. We have a US studio, a scripted studio. Um, and G was instrumental in bringing Netflix in very early. So it's a show that's made for TNT in America, which is part of Warner Media. I think at the moment, Warner Media is very focused on the US. The international arm of it, will, the international exploitation of it, will go to Netflix. G put that together. There is another show coming out of the UK, which I think has been featured at events like this in France already, called World on Fire, which is by far and away the most ambitious British show we've ever worked on. Um, not only in terms of the money that's been spent on screen, but also just the vision of it being a six-year epic that charts the Second World War from multiple angles, whether it's the Polish family, the French family, the German family, the British family. Um, Without G being there right at the beginning, I'm not sure a producer alone would have, would have said, let's go do it. Knowing that you have this commercial arm next to you, I think sometimes unlocks when you want to do a really big project. So let's get back to your strategy of buying companies. How do you identify producers and companies? I've seen here that there is a, um, a presentation of a pitch of a writer that are not coming from schools, but from other parts of the civil society, in order to have a more um, a wider image of the of the society, how do you work on that? How do you identify people, interesting people? Again, it's not um, predefined in terms of who they are, where they come from, not even what gender they are. Although you know, it's a personal thing. I'm a woman. I'd quite like to see more women running companies, but you know, that's just a personal thing. Um, but. The best example of who, who is right for us and who probably won't work within the group is America. I know this is focused on Europe, but I think some of, some of what's happening in America right now, you're going to see parallels starting to happen in Europe in the years to come. So in America right now, with Warner, with Disney, with Apple, with Amazon, with Netflix, they are bringing producers in and they're paying a lot of money to bring them in. But once you're in, you're in this thing called a walled garden. Once you're in, you work only for that platform. It would be rare, I think, in the future to see a producer who signed up with Disney working for Warners or a Warner producer working for Disney. You're in, you're in. You work for the people who own you. We are building a business in America based on the idea of independence is best for creativity. So the right producers for us in America are those producers who say, I don't want to take the check and I don't want to go behind the wall. I want to be able to make the shows I want for whoever I want because we will allow every producer who works for us to work for Netflix, Disney, Disney commissions from us, you know, Warners, all of them. They are allowed to go and pitch their shows and work with whoever they want. And they are sharing because of the structures of the deals we do and our openness to shared ownership of production labels and companies, they are sharing in the upside. If they get a big mega success, they're part of that. And that has been a complaint from the production community in America for a long time. The producers themselves were owned by the studio. They weren't necessarily participating in a big way when a show was a runaway success. The right producers for us in America are the ones who have an independence of spirit and are prepared to take that risk. Because it's easier to take the check to go behind the wall. 
but it's harder to say, I'm going to build my own company, I'm going to build my own brand. And we're lucky enough that we have a couple of partners, the most advanced of which is a man called Marty Edelstein. He has a company called Tomorrow Studios. Snowpiercer is his. He's got a new one coming up on Netflix called Cowboy Bebop and quite a few other ones coming along. And he is working with everyone. He will pitch to Showtime, he will pitch to everyone. And I do look at that, what's happening in America, and think, is that what's going to happen in Europe too? Are you going to divide the world into the people who are connected to a powerful um, commissioner and the ones who want to work for everyone, and therefore they need the kind of structure we give them, which gives them the freedom to do that? Do you walk on, on a day-to-day -day basis with the producers, I meaning do you call Marco Kiemens to see you know, what shows is, going, is, it, is it preparing and, and, or uh, Pew you were mentioning? Um, what happens if someone is coming with a very controversial subject? It's about sex, about violence, about what happened? Well, we trust the people we work with that they have good taste. <laughs> I mean, it's important, you know, back to that, how do you choose the right people? You're, you're picking the people you think are going to deliver. So as soon as you've done that, then you have the assurance that they're going to make good shows, shows that, you know, you can respect. They don't, we will not tell them what the commercially right show to make. It's not, it's not money first back into creativity. They have to choose what they want to do. Um, we tend to operate with them um, in a support and advice way rather than a day-to-day -day management. They can call any time. We talk regularly. I mean, I'm always aware of what's in development at any one of the companies that we're, um, we're involved in. Um, but the day-to-day -day decisions about who they're hiring, who they're putting on their productions, is theirs. Like, the last thing we want to do is kill entrepreneurial spirit. If we do that, we wreck everything. We wreck the culture we've tried to build, we wreck the model we've tried to build. I've been uh, approached as EPC by um, all your competitors uh, that are trying to identify a production company to buy in Germany and Spain because they are the two uh, main territories today to buy companies. How do you define, what is your, your advantage or competitive advantage compared to them and how will you convince me mm. to be bought by you? Uh, <laughs> it's back to what I've been saying. You either are attracted to what I'm, what I'm painting a picture of and you think, I want to be, I want to still be responsible for my own so decisions. It's or you think, actually, that doesn't sound right to me. I want something else. I want less risk. I want them to take the, the burden away from me of having to run the day to day. I don't know that many producers who want that, by the way. Hmm. I think most people who come into this industry and are inspired to make shows and to produce shows love the idea of continuing to allow, uh, you know, to explore the ideas that they want to make. Okay, let's get back to the UK market um, and to um, to the to the content. Um, I'm highly interested into, you know, that holy grail, the local production that can reach international audience. And, um, and we, when we were discussing together, uh, you were thinking that this kind of uh, show that can travel internationally are more um, uh, willing to come to, to the UK. Um, what is the situation of the UK today? How will you analyze it in terms of content, in terms of uh, evolution of the production? Um, I think we're continuing to invest in the UK. Um, it's, it's still the, it's our home market. It's the market where we have, you know, already a scale advantage. So we're going to continue to bring people in. I mean, the latest example was a man called Patrick Spence. Um, Patrick will be joining us in 2020. We have to wait for him. He's worth waiting for. He's very, he's a superb producer. I'm sure some of you have already, already know him. Um, and Patrick brings something I think quite unique in that he is very comfortable operating on a global stage. He's very comfortable starting a conversation in America, bringing the production along in Europe. He is, um, I think, a true global producer, and he has the ambitions to do that. I mean, he, he was the producer behind Fortitude, if you, um, if you know that show, and he's working on the Eddie, I think, as a co-production here with Lagardère for Netflix. Um, He's coming in to run his own label with an ITV, which is almost like a little studio within a studio, where he will be able to make some of his own, well, most of his own financial decisions as well. 
um, about which shows he wants to back commercially. It's not that different, I think, to the way Tetra is here. Tetra is a mini version of ITV Studios. It's a collection, it's a group of producers um, and a supportive network of producers. And I think what Patrick is looking to do is to create that as well. So it won't just be his development, it'll be talent he brings in, writers, showrunners he brings in, and he allows them and facilitates them to, to create their own shows. Um, I think the other thing that is worth pointing out is that when we talk too much about um, trying to um, create shows that work globally, I think we shouldn't forget that some of the best shows that traveled were never intended to be global successes. They were always just supposed to be about what was good writing and what was an important story nationally. And then the writing spoke for itself, the acting spoke for itself, and it traveled. I'm sure you're speaking about Broadchurch, for instance. And No, because that's an Endemol Shine show, so no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have a, a, show to you, a trailer to show you about a, um, a confession which is, uh, uh, has been written and produced by the Broadchurch team. Uh, can we show it sure. now? Please. So it's a, um, a six-parter that's coming to ITV um, later on in this year. The, the reason I chose this, because I could have chosen lots and lots of different scripts, Oh, sorry, uh, lots and lots of different clips. The reason I chose this one was to sort of touch on that point about it's important to let the authors tell the stories they want to tell. How many times have someone pitched you a show about a maverick cop who breaks all the rules to get his man? And usually it's a shiny US network show. This is the same tagline, but it's actually real. It's real people. It's a real story. And it's not a hero. It's about a man who made the wrong decisions, a cop who... A policeman who made the wrong decisions because he tried to break all the rules. And it's the real consequences of that. And that, that was something Jeff Pope, the writer, does superbly well. He was Oscar nominated for a movie called Philomena. He wrote a, uh, he wrote a movie recently called Stan and Ollie, which was about the last... It, again, it was real about the, um, Stan and Ollie's last few you know, years together touring the UK. He writes emotion, real human emotion, like... I would say no one else, but there are others. Top, he is top of his game when he writes real people. And you recognize them as real people. Not some glossy Hollywood version of a person. So this is the, precisely the, the local show you were mentioning before that uh, are targeting the local market and that can be very successful even outside. This will be a very important show for ITV Network because Jeff has delivered time and time again because he delivers characters that the audience in the UK identify with. They understand the emotional reaction. It's not some distant theatre that they're watching. They understand the connection of these people. They react in a way that it's very real. But you are taking... I was surprised when I saw the, the first show reel that you are taking so many stars. And uh, Martin Freeman, Rob Lowe, Jennifer Connelly. And I was... I'm coming from the future film industry, and I think we, we made a lot of mistakes, and in particular to give so much power to the stars that uh, are, are getting increased the budget and not bringing the audience anymore. And don't you think that we are doing the same mistake here in TV series? I don't think so much in Europe. I think if you look at the UK, and you tell me on France actually, I'd be really interested to hear what you think. In the UK, it's it's driven by writers. You start with a good script um, and you build from there. And, and often the, the actors you mention have found fame in America, but will always come back and do the shows in the UK because they're responding to the quality of the writing and they want to be part of that. In France, what is it driven by? What, what matters most? I think there's a, a, a move, a new yeah. generation of TV series that are using talents such as, you know, of course, 10%, which is the basis of the, of the series, yeah. but also um, uh, Le Bureau des Légendes, uh, which is using Mathieu Kassovitz, who was a very, very well-known uh, um, um, uh, actor, but um, it was not that much the case before. And, uh, and I can understand when I'm discussing with the broadcaster, why the hell are you asking us to have a, a storm? Because I'm, I'm, I'm telling the same. Uh, it's, uh, it's costly and maybe uh, useless uh, to bring the show. It, it's just for them to make uh, the, the service to exist easier. 
and um, and and I think it's a pity because uh, having having it um, having a TV show uh, commission only on on script on script is fantastic on on the talent of the script is fantastic, but um, but we see the changes. Mm. It is easier to market without any doubt, and I think if you are in the business of selling subscriptions you need to be able to market. It's different to free to wear. And I think that shift is because if you're trying to make it for the, you're, it's a consumer good. Selling something to someone requires an easy marketing headline. And I think an actor does that. Yes, that's true. Do you, the market is blooming uh, a lot. Uh, we can see players coming from, from everywhere. Uh, in Europe, do you think what is your vision about the market? What is uh, is it for real? What we are saying, what we are seeing, all these shows coming. Do you think there is a bubble? And uh, where is the bubble? <laughs> I don't know. I can't see it coming. If it's coming, <laughs> um, I think um, I can't see the appetite for drama dropping or for scripted shows dropping in Europe anytime soon. I can see it increasing. There is a lot of content. If you go to MIPCOM uh, in October. It's overwhelming how much content there is out there. But I cannot see a reversal of audiences' desire to be entertained. And I think Scripted has helped push the SVOD services, and, I, and we've only just begun. You know, Netflix is the big investor in Europe at the moment. Apple, Amazon, a little bit. You will, it'll be two, three years before you will have Disney, Warner's, and, and actually they will still be a small part of the overall equation because most of the investment, most of the commitment will come out of local players, the broadcasters, the local telcos, and you can already see they've responded. They, I mean, you know, TF1 has increased its spending on original programming. You know, Movistar in Spain has increased it tremendously. Viaplay in Scandinavia has increased it tremendously there is a need to continue to deliver to people who are actually spending more time in front of screens than ever before. And actually, when there are driverless cars, what do you think we're all going to be doing in those driverless cars? Maybe, I know, maybe? I know. <laughs> I know I had a panel with a Mercedes and they are, they are, they are launching a, a, yeah. their platform. Yeah. But don't you think the bubble is not then in production, but in platforms, you know? We will have to choose at some point one of them because they're all based on, on subscription. Maybe, but they haven't even offered us the choice yet. So I don't think we need to worry about it too soon. Mm. Um, I mean, the other thing as well we should talk about is the sort of, th that's the macro. Like, more hours spent in front of TV, more demand for shows. But there's other things that are happening because of those trends underneath it, which I, I find really interesting and it's important we adapt to it. So again, back to going backwards and forwards to the US and hearing what uh, everyone's asking for. We, because we have this perception that the young have abandoned television. I don't think we've been serving them content, television series, drama series for quite a while now, not in, not in any big significant way. The, the fact that they are connecting to Netflix, the fact that they're connecting to SVOD platforms, means that you're now starting to see a shift of more in development for younger demos, and that is a great thing for everyone, because we've got to serve them and we've got to make them happy, because without them, you know, there is no future for this industry. So I think the fact that you're seeing the shift of development more to the younger demo. We have a show coming up called Noughts and Crosses for the BBC. And it's a fantastic show. It is, it is slightly younger skewing because it is a, a sort of Romeo and Juliet story. And it's, it's in a parallel universe where you have to rewrite history. It sort of says, what would the world look? The question is, what would the world look like if Africa, not Europe, had been the dominant continent? So you have a shifting of social statements between the black um, population and the white population. But at, at its heart, it's a romance. It's a Romeo and Juliet story. Making shows like that, connecting with younger audiences, it's vital. And I, and I think that is also happening underneath these sort of big macro trends, is that micro trend of finding shows and development that work for them and bringing them back into a world that a few years ago, we were all kind of abandoning them, going, what's that point, making shows for young? They're not there anymore. Um, that, the other thing that I find quite fascinating, but we will have to wait and see, is whether you play with the format of the show. So we were one of the early investors in, a, in, a, in an organization called Quibi, which stands for Quick Bites, which is Jeffrey Katzenberg's new venture. 
and he is investing quite significant sums of money in creating 10-minute chunks of scripted high-end television. And he means high-end. Which is for mobile device, uh, from telephone um, uh, only. Yeah. 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 I mean, he, his whole creation is around the mobile device and how much time, especially younger people, are spending holding that mobile device. And how do you entertain them on that mobile device? Rather than forcing television in its old-fashioned, traditional way on that mobile, can you do something with it? And they are very clever in the, in the concepts they're developing to make the most of the fact that this thing is sitting in your hand and it's with you 24 hours a day. We had an experience in France called uh, Studio Plus, but that was not successful, even if Canal Plus, or maybe it's because Canal Plus was behind and has not the, 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 the financial power of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, the key B shareholders. Um, yes, we've seen more and more people watching on, on, on their mobile, and, uh, and the format is something that can, that can be worked on. Um, I wanted to, to get back about exclusivity. Mm. Uh, we've seen the, the battle for exclusivity for the biggest VOD platform or the broadcasters, um, which make the budget increasing. Uh, how do you see, do you see a, sh a possible shift in the market, as we've seen in, in the future film business, between the big budget and the very low budget, and, 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 and somewhere in the middle where no creation is there anymore or no financing for it? Or, can, can you give us your vision about in, in that perspective? I mean, from the financing point of view, I've not seen any budgets go down. Yeah. Not a single one. If you can find me one, that would be great. Please send it to me. They're not, none of them are doing that. They're all going up. Um, and they're all going up for slightly different reasons in each territory. And a lot of it is actually, we need more people. We need more crews. We need to, we need to develop um, the next generation of producers, writers, everything. That, some of that increase in production costs is just that. Um, well, ask me again what was the question <laughs> so the, the medium yeah the middle bit I, I don't know what the middle bit is I mean I don't know what the middle bit is I think generally costs are, have crept up um, because we are all competing for the same group of production crews one way or another to get them to deliver the shows and I think there is also at the top end an expectation of big beautiful shows you know but it doesn't necessarily equate. The most expensive shows are not necessarily the ones with the highest ratings. And I don't know whether you can orchestrate this. You can't sit there and design it and say, I have to spend a middle budget to hit a middle audience. That's not the way it works at all. I think some shows need the money so that you can really fulfill the potential of the vision. War, you know, World on Fire, as a Second World War project, needs to look wonderful. The world needs to look rich and interesting, and that costs. If you had tried to do it on a budget, you'd have got a slightly, a very different show. So how can we enhance, or what is your vision, how can, you know, be enhanced the, little, the low budget projects? How do you identify the new talents? That's a question we are having ourselves as producers. Mm. We need all the, the great talents are, are taken you know, by other producers or other TV series, and we need to have a new generation coming, telling new stories, stories from, uh, from that younger people that we are not addressing anymore. And, uh, and finding them and training them is a key question for us. But how, for you, at your stage, it's about mm. the project. How do you identify them? How how can we work together, or how can you work together with the producers on that? I mean, the truth is, at my level, I'm dealing with most of the time, you know, well-known, well-respected producers. It's them within their own production companies who are finding new people and bringing them up. And it's always really heartening when you see a younger director directing for the first time. But it's not, for me, I, I don't interact that much with the training side of it. Um, the, the, um, there's a possibility for question for, from the room, if you have some. Um, I'll have a um, more question about um, a question that I've been asked to, um, to ask you, because it's the theme of that, uh, of that series, series uh, um, um, event. It's the power. Where do you think is the power today? 
I, I think it's spread. I don't think it's in any one place. If you've got a piece of writing talent, they can get into any door in the UK. Um, most of the time we think the power sits with the money, whoever's funding it. Um, it's amazing when I talk to commissioners how they feel they're not the ones in power because they need to keep attracting people to come to them. When you talk to producers, they feel like they're not the ones in power. I don't know. It's a really interesting question. Where, 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 what's the conclusion of all of the conversations so far? Where is the power? I don't know. We need to ask the people, you know, here that has been attending. Um, do you have any question to Maya, which is a great opportunity to have her today? Um, so I was wondering, do you think with all the new streaming services and more increasing competition against Netflix, that that will actually give national, put national channels in the UK, Channel 4, BBC, ITV, will that give them more power because Netflix will have effectively more enemies within its own SVOD domain? The vast majority of shows commissioned are commissioned by BBC and ITV. You know, the B Netflix has got a handful of shows that I'm aware of. So that question of, you know, is Netflix got too much power? I find it very confusing. You know, the vast majority of what gets made in the UK and I'm sure here in France gets made by traditional players who are still investing themselves, increasing their investment levels themselves to do it. So I think if you see Disney coming into the marketplace, which they will eventually, they will be targeting a particular audience. And I think competition is always good. I honestly think competition is always good. You never want one powerful voice. But just statistically, in terms of money spent or hours viewed, Netflix is just added to the top of it. It hasn't necessarily wiped out everybody else. This, the bulk of it is still TF1, it's still France Television, it's still the BBC, it's still ITV, it's still Rai, still the traditional broadcasters. It just seemed, until recently, the national broadcasters felt very threatened by Netflix and they've talked about changing their models to sort of l learn from it, I guess, and that was why I asked the question. But I think what we've got in the UK is slightly different to France and the rest of Europe in that what was happening in the UK was this co-production model. So Bodyguard was Netflix outside the UK, BBC, you know, UK was the BBC's. And then there was a bit of a sort of, well, whose show is it anyway? Um, the one name you didn't see in all of that was ITV, by the way. <laughs> Um, and we're relatively neutral about this idea of whose show is it anyway. Um, that doesn't necessarily apply to the rest of Europe about whose show is it anyway. I mean, the, the Netflix investment here is, from what I can tell, is mostly originals, isn't it, rather than co-productions with existing broadcasters. Actually, they are developing that a lot. Are they? Uh, Good. Yes. yes. Uh, and um, we think that that's a model that is uh, working quite well. Um, as EBC, we, we are um, looking very uh, closely into co-production yes. and the co-production between countries is very low because it's uh, complicated to have two broadcasters on the same table because it, they do not want to share power uh, of decisions. So, but what we've seen is more a co-production uh, through windows, yeah. uh, which was the case, for instance, for uh, my brilliant friend, which was a, a Ryan HBO. Uh, show or um, many other examples. We have a, have a, a, an example in, a, in, in Argentina, uh, Monzon, which was a, a Disney and, uh, and um, another broadcaster. And that's something that for us producers is something that we look at very closely because we can keep some rights and which is uh, how we can stay independent is to have the rights. Any other question? Yes. Two, three, four, yes. Hello. Uh, are you expecting uh, shows only in English? No. Okay. No, of course not. I, you know, I don't think any... I, I, um, the, the, the team from Tetra here, I don't think... Jean-Francois, you've not made anything in English, have you? No. Yeah, very good too. I like French. I wish I could speak better French is my <laughs> honest answer. No, not at all. You know, we, we're not trying to anglicize or change the companies we invest in. Wherever we are, we want the company to still be Tetra, we want it to be Catlea, we want them to be a French producer, an Italian producer, making the shows that they think are right for their audiences. So you, give, you, you are giving me the opportunity to show you a trailer about Petra, the, the, <laughs> the, latest, uh, the latest show produced by, by Catlea, and then we will get back to the question. Can we go for the last trailer, please?
Um, so that's a new show that um, Cat Lea are producing for Sky in Italy, and it's based on Spanish novels, and I just love it. I'm, I'm starting to see the, the, the rushes coming in, and it's just wonderful because it's about the relationship between the two of them. She's had a she's a she's a you know, police detective who's had a career behind a desk all her life, and suddenly she's thrown into managing the violent crime unit, and her partner is a guy who's close to retirement and is a little reluctant to have her as a boss. It's wonderful. It's yes. really good chemistry. <laughs> Very good for female. Another question over there. Hi, Maria. Uh, my question's about use of data in terms of trying to anticipate what audiences might be wanting. Um, Netflix is, uh, there's been a lot of talk of Netflix using data to inform its decisions about what it's going to do next. Um, but how much do you feel that data is important as opposed to using traditional methods of focus groups? Or do you use other things? Do you think data is king in terms of what you're going to decide to do and the industry will decide to do moving forward? I, I, with this, I think we've got no choice in terms of using data. I mean, we're all going to be using them more. It's going to be part of our lives. It's probably more relevant to the commissioning side when they're making the decision about what kind of show they think will work. And sometimes it's worked, in my opinion, and sometimes it hasn't, you know, when they've, it's been too formulaic. But I think they're learning all the time. And certainly that, that, that trend we're seeing in terms of active development for the younger demo is a response to knowing that there is a strong teen, 20-something audience out there who are responding really well to their shows. Um, so that's a good thing. We're on, we're on the sort of studio side of it, managing a group of creators. Therefore, how much contact I have with data on a daily basis is relatively limited. And we still, but we still very much want that consumer testing. We, we like the idea of putting the shows in front of audiences because that response helps us get the shows better and better and better and tighter and tighter. Will you use certain scenes, let's say, to test uh, a larger product before you release the product, like through social media? We haven't done it yet, but that's a really interesting idea. I think that's a really interesting idea about releasing little snippets, you mean, before you release? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It could be a trailer, it could be a sizzle, but it could also be the first scene, you know, or if you've been in using social media to be in touch with, let's say, a young audience, mm -hmm. testing a particular scene or a part of an episode to see whether it's working for them. It's a good idea. We haven't done it yet. I've seen other questions. Yes, over there. Hi, Maria. This is Aminori from TBI. Um, I was just I was curious if you could update us on, um, and I'm not sure how much oversight you have of this, but, but for Breadbox, um, which was meant to launch basically um, this fall, I believe, but I know that there had been some um, talk of delays with the BBC, um, I guess just because of the model in France with, uh, with models like Salto also having similar delays. Um, I guess that's a slightly different case than you know, there, but just do, do you have an, an update on BritBox and what we can expect? I'm not responsible for BritBox, so I'm not the person to give you an update on the UK launch at all. Um, I mean, I, you know, from a content supplier's point of view, it's good news to have a local um, branded um, platform that will champion British shows. I mean, BritBox US has done really well. It's, it's, it's doing super in terms of subscriber acquisitions and it's sort of proved the case about an appetite and markets outside of the, um, the UK for British content. Um, I, I mean, what's the latest with the French SVOD platform? Salto? Mm. Is there someone who can answer that question? Because I can't. <laughs> Yes. It, um, there were some announcements that it's kind of getting held up in uh, essentially bureaucracy. The, the, the uh, canals have been waiting for, essentially they have to get approval from the government. And there was one administrator who, who they thought there was going to decide, I think this was announced at, uh, in Lille, at Series Mania, and suddenly he said, well, no, it's not me, it should be another government body. So I think the French, there was announcements by the major uh, networks here of frustration that they're waiting for the government to decide, and the one person they thought was going to decide said, no, it's another agency and another guy. So I think they're waiting for another six months. That's so French. Thank you very much, Maya. Thank you. Thank you.